Welcome to From His Heart with Pastor Jeff Shreve, who's in a new series today called Revelation, The Triumph of the Lamb. After the rapture, what will those who are left behind experience during the tribulation? Learn more about this terrifying time in today's message called, So It Begins. It was in the early 30s when a man came to power in Germany. His name was Adolf Hitler. By the time he was finished with his reign, an estimated 50 million people were killed in World War II. He oversaw the Holocaust the murder of six million Jews in the most gruesome, barbaric ways. It was in the late 1990s, in that decade, where there was civil war in the Congo, in Africa. People were killed in horrible ways. There was mass rape in the Congo, so much so that they did the calculations and said rape was taking place to the tune of 48 rapes per hour, as young as 18 months old, as old as 80. ISIS came to power in 2014, the Islamic State, with brutal murders, tortures, turning women into sex slaves. In America, we've had some of the most horrific things happen. I was reading yesterday about a crime that took place in Albuquerque. Little 10-year-old Victoria Martins was celebrating her 10th birthday. Her mother, her cousin, and her mother's boyfriend were there. They shot her up with methamphetamine They sexually abused her. They stabbed her and strangled her and dismembered her. The chief of police in Albuquerque said this, this was the most gruesome act of evil I've ever seen. Sutherland Springs, about a year ago, November 5th, 2017, a man came into First Baptist Church, Sutherland Springs, murdered 26 people injured 20 more before he was shot and eventually took his own life. There's a question in the Old Testament, the last book in the Old Testament, Malachi chapter 2, verse 17, and the question is this, where is the God of justice? You know, we see all these atrocities that take place in our world, in our lifetime. And we wonder, how how long is this going to go on, Lord? When will you step in, Lord? When will you judge the earth? That judgment comes in Revelation chapter 6. We're studying the book of the Revelation in a series entitled The Triumph of the Lamb. And today we're going to look at the beginning of this period known as the tribulation, the time of anguish, the time of tremendous pressure and difficulty and trouble. It's called in the Old Testament, Jeremiah chapter 30, the time of Jacob's distress, the time of Jacob's trouble. It lasts seven years. Some people say, well, where do you come up with seven years? We come up with seven years from Daniel chapter 9. 
Daniel was given a vision of what was going to happen to Israel in the future. He was given a vision of 70 weeks, and not weeks of days, weeks of years. He was given a vision of 490 years that were going to take place in the world, specifically as it relates to Israel. 483 of those years have passed. We're waiting on the last week, Daniel's 70th week. And that is what is detailed here in the book of the Revelation, the time of tribulation, the time where God pours out his wrath on a Christ-rejecting world. So here is the question. What is awaiting those who experience the tribulation? In your outline today on the back, I included a little timeline to help you, to help you keep things straight. Now, not everybody agrees with this timeline. This is America. You have a right to be wrong. And so, <laughs> just teasing. This is how I understand, and not myself alone, many uh, Bible scholars see this as a timeline for the end times, where you have where we are right now, the present church age, and then we're awaiting the coming of the Lord in the clouds, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, when he's going to come and get us and rescue us. We are looking and waiting for Christ. We're not looking to see the Antichrist. We're looking to see the Lord Jesus Christ, and he delivers us from the wrath to come. And as we begin Revelation chapter 6, we're going to see it's God pouring out his wrath on an unbelieving world. Jesus talked about this in Matthew chapter 24, called the Olivet Discourse. He spoke to his disciples on the Mount of Olives, and they were asking him questions about the future. When will this happen? When will these things be? What will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? And Jesus talks about birth pains. He said that false Christs are going to come, and there's going to be wars and rumors of wars, and there's going to be famine, and there's going to be earthquakes, and they're going to deliver you over to death. He said these are the, just the beginning of birth pains. And then what happens? Well, we know, and all you ladies know who have had babies, birth pangs come and they're, they're, they get increasingly more painful until the baby is born. Jesus said uh, the, the wars and rumors of wars and famines, those things, we're going to see that's birth pangs. And then we have this thing at the middle point of the tribulation at the three and a half year mark of the tribulation, desecration of the temple. The Antichrist is going to present himself as God. No longer do you worship God. I am God. You worship me. And the Bible calls that from the book of Daniel, the abomination of desolation. It's when the abominable one, the Antichrist, Satan in the flesh, sets himself up as God. And Jesus said, when that happens, get out of the city because there is going to come a great tribulation such as the world has never seen. And that is the last half of the tribulation period, and it ends with the return of Christ and the beginning of the millennial kingdom. So that's the timeline of the end times. It kind of helps you. And today we're going to look at the, the church has been raptured, and now what happens? Well, as we saw last time, Revelation chapter 5, there was a scroll that the Father, the one who sits on the throne, gave to the Son, the Lamb who has overcome the Lion of the tribe of Judah. It was a seven-sealed scroll. We have a picture of that scroll. It was a scroll written on the inside and on, on both sides, and it was sealed with seven seals. And so it was one of those scrolls. It was a large scroll, and you would open it up, and you'd break a seal to open it, and you'd roll it, for a while and you'd read and then you'd come to another seal and you have to break that seal and another seal and you have to break that seal and there was no one found worthy and John began to weep because no one was found worthy to take the scroll. The scroll is the last will and testament of the Father. It's the title deed of the earth. And they told John, stop weeping. The lion of the tribe of Judah, the lamb has overcome. He's worthy to take, take the scroll. And he took that in Revelation chapter 6 we have the opening of the scroll. Revelation 6, 1, And I saw when the Lamb broke one of the seven seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures saying 
as with a voice of thunder, Come. And I looked, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on it had a bow, and a crown was given to him, and he went out conquering and to conquer. What do we see in Revelation chapter 6? John Walvoord, the great uh, Bible teacher and scholar and end times expert, he said Revelation chapter 6 is the most important, one of the most important chapters in all of the book of the Revelation. It gives us an overview of what this tribulation period is going to be like. And I want you to notice with me three discoveries from Revelation chapter 6. First discovery, the Antichrist will come to power. The rider of the white horse. Some people say, well, that's Jesus because in Revelation 19, it says Jesus rides on a white horse. But I don't think that's the Lord Jesus Christ. I think this is the false Messiah. This is the Antichrist. He comes presenting himself as Messiah. He comes riding on a white horse, but he is the false Messiah. He has a bow but he doesn't have any arrows. And he comes to power, and that is the beginning of the tribulation period. That's the beginning of Daniel's 70th week, because Daniel says that this one that comes to power is going to make a covenant, a peace covenant with the many, speaking of Israel, for one week. And so the beginning of the tribulation starts with this peace covenant that the Antichrist, who comes seemingly in peace, he sets up with Israel. So that's the very first thing, the very first seal that is broken is the coming of the Antichrist. Now at first, when he comes, daily life will seem normal. I mean, we talk about how bad the tribulation period is. But when the first seal is open and the Antichrist comes, he comes with a bow and no arrows. And you say, well, I think everything's pretty cool. I mean, he's coming. He's made a peace treaty, and there's peace in the Middle East for the first time in who knows how long, uh, maybe ever. And there's peace in the Middle East because the Antichrist is there. He's Israel's friend. Israel's going to think he's their Messiah. And life is pretty much going on. Everything seems to be hunky-dory, just like it was Jesus said, in the days of Noah and in the days of Lot. Matthew chapter 24, the scripture says this from the lips of Jesus. For the coming of the Son of Man will be just like the days of Noah. For in those days which were before the flood, they were eating and drinking. They were marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark. And they did not understand until the flood came and took them all away. So shall the coming of the Son of Man be. I think this is the calm before the storm. So the very first seal, the Antichrist comes, and the people say, hey, everything is going well, and life seems to be going on, and uh, this ain't no thing. Uh, this is no big deal. And the world will believe that peace has come. He'll make a firm covenant with the many for one week. But he breaks it in the middle of the week at that three-and-a-half-year mark, and he sets up, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, sets himself up in the temple of God and declares that he is God. You no longer worship God the Father. I am God. You worship me. And that begins the great tribulation, the last half of the three-and-a-half years. You know, it's interesting how the Scripture words things. In the book of Thessalonians, the Thessalonians, a, a place where Paul was only there for uh, a few short weeks, but those people came to know Christ and they loved the Lord, and Paul taught them about the second coming, and they were so uh, anxiously awaiting the return of Christ. They, they were awaiting the, the Lord from heaven who was going to deliver them from the wrath 
that was to come. And they asked Paul lots of questions about the coming of the Lord. He told them about the rapture, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, and then he told them about the day of the Lord. And this is what he says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, beginning in verse 1. Now, as to the times and the epochs, brethren, you have no need of anything to be written to you, for you yourselves know full well that the day of the Lord will come just like a thief in the night, when they are saying, peace and safety, then destruction will come upon them suddenly like birth pangs upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. This is how I see the beginning of the tribulation period. I see the first seal that's broken, and then I see a little lag time for there to be this false sense of peace, for people to get comfortable and think that this Antichrist is all that in a bag of chips. Oh, he's wonderful. He's our deliverer. He's our Messiah. He is bringing peace. And they're going to be saying peace and safety, and then destruction will come upon them. So the first discovery, the Antichrist will come to power. The second discovery, there will be hell on earth. Hell on earth. Now, it says in verse 2, And I looked, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on it had a bow, and a crown was given to him. That's a victor's crown, a Stephanos. And he went out conquering and to conquer. So the Antichrist is coming conquering and to conquer. Now, what if you don't want to be conquered? He has a bow but no arrows, but he's going conquering and to conquer. Well, if you don't want to be conquered, then there's going to be conflict and a war. Verse 3, and when he broke the second seal, I heard the second living creature saying, come, and another, a red horse, went out, and to him who sat on it, it was granted to take peace from the earth, and that men should slay one another, and a great sword was given to him. Verse 5, and he broke the third seal. I heard the third living creature saying, Come. And I looked, and behold, a black horse, and he who sat on it had a pair of scales in his hand. And I heard, as it were, a voice in the center of the four living creatures saying, A quart of wheat for a denarius, and three quarts of barley for a denarius, and do not harm the oil and the wine. Verse 7, and he broke the fourth seal. I heard the voice of the, four living creature, of the fourth living creature saying, Come, and I looked, and behold, an ashen horse, a sickly, green, pale horse. And he who sat on it had the name Death, and Hades was following with him. And authority was given to them over a fourth of the earth to kill with sword and with famine and with pestilence and by the wild beasts of the earth. First horseman, the Antichrist, appears to be okay, and then the second seal is broken, and the third seal is broken, and the fourth seal is broken. The second seal is war. The third seal is famine. Court of wheat for a denarius. Court of wheat would feed one man one meal. It takes a day's wage for one man to get enough food to satisfy his appetite. He gets three quarts of barley, which is much cheaper. You can get three meals out of that. Here's the point. It will take all your money just to survive, just to get by on the bare necessities. You don't have any money to do anything else. And then the fourth seal is death. It's interesting where it says he's on an ashen horse. That word ashen in the Greek is where we get our English word chlorine. If you've ever seen a picture of chlorine gas, it has a green color to it. We talk about people when they get sick, they get green uh, uh, among the gill, or along the gills. You know, you're, you're sick to your stomach, you start turning green. That's what that horse does. The, the horse and the rider is death. And after that rider comes Hades. Death takes the body, Hades takes the soul. And they ride together. So the four horsemen... They bring war, they bring famine, they bring pestilence, they bring death. All those things fit together. When you have someone who is conquering and to conquer, well, how does he do that? He's going to do that with war for those countries that don't want to, those people that don't want to knuckle under. He does that with war. Well, when you have war, then you're going to have famine that results from the devastations and ravages of war and that 
uh, not only famine, then you're going to have pestilences, you're going to have difficulties, you're going to have lots of death. And verse 8 says that this rider on the fourth horse, this rider called death, he has authority to kill one-fourth of the population. One-fourth. Unprecedented. The world's population, I looked it up yesterday, if Google can be trusted, is 7.44 billion people. That's the world's population. Now, when the rapture comes, it is said that there are 2.2 billion Christians on the world, in the world. I, I don't believe that for a second. But that's anybody who says, well, yeah, I guess I'm a Christian. Uh, you know, I, I'm an American, so I guess I'm a Christian. That's, that's any of those folks. There are lots of churches that don't preach Christ crucified, and they would say that they're Christians. So if you take 2.2 billion is what they say, maybe of those 2.2 billion, maybe 400 million are true and genuine, really been born again. There, there are lots of tares among the wheat in any church, and some churches, a whole lot of them are tares. And so maybe you have 400 million that get raptured out. That leaves behind 7 billion people. And a quarter of those 7 billion die in seal four. That's 1.75 billion people. It was in the 1300s, the mid 1300s, where you had the black death, the bubonic plague that killed 75 million people. 75 million, that's a lot. That's nothing compared to 1.75 billion people that will die. It's beyond bad. And you think, man, that's just the first four. And you think, I don't think it can get any worse. Oh, it gets much worse. It gets much worse because with the seals, the seven seals, when he breaks the seventh seal, that contains seven trumpets of judgment. So there's seven more things. And when he blows, the angel blows the seventh trumpet, that contains seven bowls of wrath. So you have seals of wrath, you have trumpets of wrath, you have bowls of wrath, and God is just pouring it out on a sinful, Christ-rejecting world. It's hell on earth. And then it says this in verse 9. And when he broke the fifth seal, I saw underneath the altar the souls of those who had been slain because of the word of God and because of the testimony which they had maintained. And they cried out with a loud voice saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, will you refrain from judging and avenging our blood on those who dwell on the earth? And there was given to each one of them a white robe and they were told that they should rest for a little while longer until the number of their fellow servants and their brethren who were to be killed even as they had been should be completed also. The tribulation saints will be killed for their faith in Christ. Now, I don't believe this is talking about the church. I believe the church has been raptured before the opening of the seals. I think the church was raptured in Revelation chapter 4. But this speaks of those who put their faith and trust in Christ during that seven-year period of time. See, people say, are, are there folks getting saved during the tribulation? Yes, lots of them. Revelation chapter 7 speaks of the 144,000 Jews who are like Apostle Paul's going out into the world and sharing Christ. And the Lord puts a special seal on them these 144,000. You know, we have a group, Jehovah's False Witnesses, that say that's all there are, are 144,000. You've got to be in the 144,000. You're not in the 144,000. You don't get to go to heaven. But that's just a bunch of bunk. There are 144,000 Jews during the tribulation who are witnesses for Christ. And there are many people who come to faith in Christ during the tribulation period. And they pay for their faith in Christ, so many of them, with their lives. The, the, the souls that John saw under the altar, they're those, it says in Revelation 7, who had come out of the tribulation. They were murdered 
by Antichrist in the tribulation period. Now, one thing you need to remember that is very helpful when you read Revelation, because as we said when we started this series, it's the book of blessing. Blessed is the one who reads and heeds the prophecies of this book. And Revelation wasn't given to scare us, it was given to prepare us. It was given as God is saying, this is a preview of what's getting ready to come onto planet Earth. So be ready, be prepared, and make sure you miss out on all that judgment. But there are those who are going to miss out, and do they have an opportunity during the tribulation? They do. They do, but it's going to cost them to believe, and for many of them, it will cost them their very lives. So Revelation gives us kind of a timeline. It tells, it tells us what's going to happen, and it culminates in the return of Christ, Revelation chapter 19. But there are certain chapters in Revelation that the scholars like to call parenthetical chapters. What does that mean? That means it's not flowing in uh, consecutive order. So Revelation chapter 7 is not like, okay, chapter 6 happened, and then there's chapter 7. Revelation chapter 7 is pulling back and saying, okay, let me tell you about these tribulation saints. They were talked about at the, in chapter 6 at the breaking of the fifth seal, all these who died. Let me tell you who they are. And so you have different chapters like that. Revelation chapter 12 and 13, they're parenthetical. They pull back. They start talking about uh, the Antichrist and the devil, and you say, I don't see how that fits in. Well, it doesn't fit in chronologically. It pulls back and says, well, this is something you need to know about this situation and this time period. But there are many of these people who will be saved and will be murdered by Antichrist. He sets up in Revelation chapter 13 a system, the mark of the beast, six, 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 and you have to get that mark either on your right hand or on your forehead. And if you don't get that mark, then you can't buy or sell. No seal, no sale. And if you can't buy or sell in a time of famine, you're in big time trouble. And many people are going to be killed. 1.75 billion are going to be killed on the earth. And then all these martyrs going through hell on earth in the extermination that comes from Antichrist. Discovery number three, the wrath of God will be poured out on a sinful world. That's what's going to happen in the tribulation. It's the wrath of God. Now, some people say, well, you know, the first five seals, that's just the wrath of Satan. That's the wrath of man. And we have this group that they call themselves the pre-wrath rapture people. And they say that the rapture occurs at the breaking of the sixth seal because that's the seal that is associated with the wrath of God. But that's not what this says. Who's the one breaking the seals? It's not man. It's not Satan. It's the Lord Jesus Christ. It's the lamb who has the scroll. The lamb is breaking the seals. It's all the wrath of the lamb. And the Bible talks about this day of the Lord in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. Paul talked about it. Peter talked about it. John is describing it. But there's this thing that's introduced in the Old Testament, 19 times in the Old Testament, the day of the Lord, the day of the Lord, the day of the Lord. You say, what in the world's the day of the Lord? Well, it's not a 24-hour day. It's a time period. It's a time where the Lord has his way, and he weighs in on the situation going on in the earth. And the Bible writers, Isaiah, Ezekiel, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Zephaniah, they talk about this. Here's some of the things they say about this. The day of the Lord is darkness, not light. It's great and terrible. Who can endure it? It's destruction from the Almighty. It's a time of doom for the nations. It's a terrifying end to all the inhabitants of the earth. Isaiah chapter 13, verse 9, puts it this way. Behold, the day of the Lord is coming, cruel with fury and burning anger, to make the land a desolation, and he will exterminate its sinners from it. When does the day of the Lord begin? Some people say, well, it doesn't begin until the Lord comes back at the battle of Armageddon. That's when he wipes everybody out. That's the day of the Lord. But I think the day of the Lord begins as he begins to open the scroll. 
And this is what the scripture says in Revelation 6, beginning in verse 12. John said, I looked when he broke the sixth seal, and there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth made of hair, and the whole moon became like blood, and the stars of the sky fell to the earth as a fig tree casts its unripe figs when shaken by a great wind. Meteors are hitting the earth. And the sky was split apart like a scroll when it is rolled up, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. And the kings of the earth and the great men and the commanders and the rich and the strong and every slave and free man hid themselves in the caves and among the rocks of the mountains. And they said to the mountains and to the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the presence of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the lamb for the great day of their wrath has come and who is able to stand? Here's the thing about the judgments that come on the earth. They are severe, they are intensifying, and they are terrifying. I had a guy tell me one time, he said, you know, this thing about the tribulation and the rapture, he said, I don't want to be raptured. He said, I want to go through the tribulation. I want to fight the Antichrist. I said, you do? He said, yes. I said, well, time out. Hey, I got a shirt in my closet with a big S on it for stupid. I'd like to give it to you. I didn't really say that, but I thought that. I thought, what an idiot. No one wants to go through the tribulation period. No one. And Jesus said, after the abomination of desolation, and he said, when you get into that second half, that last three and a half years, he called it the great tribulation. He said, unless those days had been cut short, no life would have been saved. Every single person on the planet would die if the Lord didn't truncate those days because it's too severe. Nobody can stand. And so these people are experiencing the wrath of the Lamb. It doesn't start at seal six. It starts at seal one where the things start into motion with the rise of Antichrist and the severity and the intensity. It's just uh, horrific and it's terrifying. And did you hear what the people said? All the people, the kings and the commanders, the great men and the, and the lowest of the low, they say to, they hide in the mountains and the rocks and they say to the mountains and to the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the presence of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the lamb. Now I want you to notice this. The people of the world, they call to the rocks instead of calling out to God. Isn't that amazing? Call out to the rocks, to Mother Nature, so to speak. Protect me, hide me, fall on me, and protect me because the wrath of that uh, terrible God is coming to me. Call out to the rocks instead of calling out to the rock of ages, the rock of ages who responds to a repentant heart. The rock of ages who, when he was dying on the cross, heard that penitent thief say, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he responded to that, responded to that guy and saved that guy as he's dying upon the cross. That's the God that we serve. He's the father of the prodigal son. As you've heard me say before, that song, if you take one step toward the Savior, my friend, you'll find his arms open wide. That's the God we serve. They don't cry out to that God. They cry out to the rocks. Why? because they hate God. They hate God. You know one of the phrases that you'll find in the book of Revelation four different times when the judgments are so severe, it says, and they did not repent, and they did not repent, and they did not repent, and they did not repent. They didn't repent so as to give God glory. You know, we have uh, in the fighting world today, we have the MMA and the UFC fighters, and they get in the octagon and they fight. And uh, when I was a kid growing up, we had boxing, which was pretty rough, but nothing like this, where you just keep pounding somebody with your elbow and your knee and all that stuff, and it's so gruesome and so bloody. But one of the things you'll notice in the octagon, when somebody has you in a hold that says, I'm going to break your arm in this arm bar unless you tap out. I don't care how tough the guys are, they tap out. And God is bringing on all this pressure. 
and the people won't tap out. What do they do? They blaspheme God. They blaspheme God. It's amazing. They call out to the rocks, and they don't call out to the rock of ages. And they give the wrong answer to the right question. They ask the right question. Verse 16. It says, fall on us and hide us from the presence of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb, for the great day of their wrath has come, and who is able to stand? How can you stand before the wrath of God in the day of the Lord where he pours out his wrath? Can anyone stand? Who is able to stand? You know that same question was asked, 1 Samuel chapter 6. When, if you remember in the story in 1 Samuel, the Philistines took the Ark of the Covenant. Uh, the, the Israelites had brought the Ark of the Covenant to battle with the Philistines because they, they thought they had God in a box. And they said, you know, if we bring the uh, God in the box to the battle, he can't, we can't lose because uh, God is God and he'll uh, enable us to win. And they treated God like he's a lucky, lucky rabbit's foot. And uh, God allowed them to be defeated. And the Philistines took the Ark of the Covenant. They took the box that had the Ten Commandments and Aaron's rod that budded and the jar of manna. They took that, and they took it back, and they put it in their little church building where they worship Dagon, the fish god, half man, half fish, and they put it in there, and they said, our God defeated uh, the God of the Israelites. Came the next morning, their God's on his face before the Ark of the Covenant. They said, man, Dagon, you can't do that. You get, get back up here. We won. The next day they come, and he's all broken before the God of Israel. And then God gave them tumors to all those Philistines that had the Ark of the Covenant. Tumors. That's what the Scripture says. You know what it really was? Hemorrhoids. God has a sense of humor. He said, I'm going to give you guys a pain where the sun don't shine. And... Uh, they didn't want to have the Ark of the Covenant anymore, and so they'd send it to another Philistine city, and they, those guys got tumors too, and they, you know, there are five cities there with the Philistines on the coast of the Mediterranean, and uh, man, they, just, they said, we got to get rid of this box. It's going to kill us. So they sent it back to Israel, and it came to a place called Beth Shemesh, and the men of Beth Shemesh said, we got to make sure they didn't take anything out of the Ark of the Covenant, and they looked in the Ark of the Covenant and God killed them with a great slaughter. And they were afraid, and they asked this question, who is able to stand before the Lord, this holy God? That's the same question. The wrath of God has come, the wrath of the Lamb. Who's able to stand? You know, there was another time in the Bible in the Gospels, where the wrath of God came, didn't come on mortal man. It came on the God man. He took all your sin and all my sin and all the sin of the whole world. It was boiled down in that cup. Remember, he prayed three times, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. And the silence from heaven said, my son, there is no other way. And Jesus willingly drank down that cup, the cup of the sin of the whole world. And when Jesus died upon the cross, the wrath of God fell upon him as he became sin for us. And he took your wrath and he took my wrath and he took the wrath for all the sins of the whole world. The Gettys sing a wonderful song and the lyrics say this, this the power of the cross. Christ became sin for us, took the blame, bore the wrath. I stand forgiven at the cross. Who is able to stand before the Lord, this holy God? I am. I am. You know why? Because I put my faith and trust in Jesus. 
I put my faith where God put my sins, and that was on the Lord Jesus Christ. He took my wrath. I'm forgiven of my sins, and I'm freed from the wrath of God because all the wrath of God fell on Jesus. Romans chapter 8, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, for the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set us free from the law of sin and of death. The only way you can stand before the Lord, this holy God, is if you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ who took your wrath on the cross. But if you reject Jesus as these people in Revelation 6 have, then you stand and you receive the wrath because you deserve the wrath. Jesus paid a debt he didn't owe. He paid a debt you and I couldn't pay. I like what the Lord says in Matthew 21, as he is remonstrating with the religious leaders, he said, have you never read this scripture, the stone which the builders rejected? This became the chief's cornerstone, chief cornerstone. Well, of course they had read that. That was a very important scripture. And Jesus was saying, I'm the chief cornerstone that you, the builders, have rejected. And he went on to say this. He said, whoever falls upon this stone will be broken to pieces. What does that mean, you fall upon this stone? When you understand that you are a sinner, a desperate sinner, a helpless sinner in need of a savior, and that Jesus is the cornerstone, he's the rock of ages, he is your only hope, and you fall upon him in brokenness and in repentance, you're saved. You're broken to pieces, but you're saved. Whoever falls upon this stone will be broken to pieces, but whomever this stone falls upon will scatter him like dust. The difference between a Christian and a non-Christian, a Christian has fallen upon the stone a Christian has cried out to the Lord for mercy and grace and has said, in effect, in my hands no price I bring, but simply to thy cross I cling. He falls upon the stone. The non-Christian rejects the Lord and his payment on the cross, tries to help the Lord out with his good works, is not broken. He is prideful, and the stone falls on him and scatters him like dust. Who is able to stand before the Lord, this holy God? I'll close with this scripture. Jude, the last epistle before the book of the Revelation, says this as it closes out. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to make you stand in the presence of his glory, blameless with great joy, to the only God our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time, now and forever. The Lord is able to make you stand if you'll fall in brokenness before him. Hey, where will you be when the wrath of God comes? Our friend, the Lord is coming soon, and now is the time, if you're not ready, to get yourself ready. Simply pray this prayer from your heart. Lord Jesus, I need you. I know that I'm a sinner, and I'm lost, and I can't save myself. But Jesus, I believe that you died on the cross for my sins, that you rose again from the dead, and that you are Lord of all. And right now, Jesus, I ask you to come into my heart, forgive me of all my sins, be my Lord and Savior. I surrender all to you. My friend, if you'll pray that kind of prayer and mean it, the Lord will come in and your life will never be the same. I'd love to hear from you, to know that you're watching, to know that God is using this broadcast to make a difference in your life, to know that you just prayed that prayer with me to receive Christ as Savior and Lord. Please take the time to call that toll-free number on your screen. Write me, email me, let me know what's going on and how we can pray for you you really are important to God and you're important to us and we're here for you. Thank you for watching From His Heart today, the viewer-supported broadcast ministry of Dr. Jeff Shreve, who believes that no matter how badly you may have messed up in life, God still loves you and He has a wonderful plan for your life. Find out more about that plan 
go to fromhisheart.org. Real truth, real